coming up on this episode of The Roundtable. If we're going to think clearly about what sort of phenomena are going to increase those pressures to a point where we go from whatever it is, 19 or 20 quote unquote mass shootings a year to hundreds or thousands. What will contribute to those pressures? Well, a belief that reality does not exist and we live in a simulation, a belief that everything about the human person is totally mutable, a belief that someone's thoughts about you can pose an existential threat to your life, and a belief that the only thing that can restore human agency in a world conquered by calculating machines is the unfettered exercise of the imagination. All of these forces are at work right now in pushing and pulling individuals in the direction of seeing quote unquote trans identities as sacred, as earning a sort of ticket to retributive justice. You know, when you see uh, a person caught in the grip of this matrix of spiritual attitudes, murder multiple Christian children, you really start to reckon with what kinds of forces are going to lead toward a true epidemic of slaughter in America. And topping it all off, if you live in a country where, well, yes, you don't want to break any laws, but if you're the right kind of person, well, you can break laws, you can commit crimes, you can kill people, and nothing will happen to you. That's only going to make it worse. So we are playing with fire here. Hello, and welcome once again to The Roundtable, your weekly publishers and editors podcast here at The American Mind. I'm your host, Spencer Clavin, features editor of The American Mind, and I'm joined this week by editor James Hulos, managing editor Seth Barron, publisher and president Ryan Williams. And it's always a treat, uh, always great to be joined also by contributing editor Helen Roy. And if usually, even in dark moments, I uh, attempt to engage in some form of gallows humor or levity, I'm finding it extremely difficult to feel anything but uh, sorrow and distress over the main top line heading right now. And so I think I'm just going to launch into it. And I know that we'll all have a lot to say about this event. So I'm going to try and give some bare bones uh, sort of facts for those that aren't familiar, but I don't imagine that many people uh, won't have heard something about the shooting at Covenant School in my newly adopted hometown of Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, a Presbyterian school, the Covenant School, was subject to a school shooting. Six people were killed, three children, three staff members. This is a school associated with the Presbyterian Church uh, in America. Uh, and this is the more conservative of the two branches of the Presbyterian Church. There's PCA, there's PCUSA, um, and whereas there's sort of variety within each PCA is uh, generally more conservative, and specifically on uh, issues related to sex and sexuality. This is germane. This is relevant because of the because of the killer. Because uh, you know, it's, there's always, to my mind, kind of an open question whether you should even name these people, but uh, in this case, I think the answer is we, we should. Audrey Elizabeth Hale has been identified as a shooter 28 years old, and one uh, perhaps uh, relevant piece of information is that, you know, Seth and I were texting about this in the you know moments after it happened, and it was becoming clear that this was a person who considered herself trans, and we were trying to figure out, is this a male-to-female trans person or a female-to-male? Trans person and truly at Orwellian levels, it became 
quite difficult to identify, uh, which it was, but it is now clear uh, after some a little bit of digging that this person is a woman who was using he him pronouns, starting to pursue a course of female to male transition, and certainly going sometimes by another name, Aiden. Audrey's victims are as follows. I'm going to name them because I think it's important. Five pronounced dead at a hospital in one scene. Um, and please, you know, forgive me if I go through some of these names, but Evelyn Deakhouse, William Kinney, and Hallie Scruggs, all of them nine years old. Substitute teacher Cynthia Peak, age 61. Custodian Mike Hill, age 61, and head of school Catherine Kuntz. We've also seen on Twitter and online some pretty sobering and I would say both harrowing and, and quite remarkable, impressive videos, body cam footage. Nashville police who responded, who took uh, the shooter out uh, to lead police officers, worth mentioning Rex Engelbert and Officer Colasso were kind of the two at the head running point on this extremely efficient textbook level response that has been compared, contrasted favorably with the response in Uvalde, Texas, which uh, involved a lot of sort of a vacillation and, and delay that probably seems to have cost lives. Here, you know, this is a, a police department in which I, you know, I know some people and I would, you know, it doesn't surprise me at all to learn that this is a, a really crack team of guys that just uh, knew exactly how to do this, how to work together, carry through, uh, follow through with enormous courage and heroism. It's probably not going to come as a surprise to anybody that within minutes, really, of this event becoming uh, national news, there was all sorts of incredibly distasteful and gross, and I would have to describe it as, as evil uh, response. There was the normal sort of, you know, this is a situation that calls for us to abolish the Second Amendment, guns are bad, right? And that's the only problem here. There's no underlying sort of social causes or, or human causes. Um, and then really spectacularly as a spectacular act of hypocrisy and, and sinister kind of malice from the trans lobby and from those who have spent all sorts of ink and uh, efforts trying to characterize, you know, mass shootings as specific, specifically a white male problem. It's when white man commits shooting the shows that the systemic racism, the sort of uh, dimensions of, of blame immediately inverted this to be that this is all because Tennessee lawmakers are uh, trying to prevent kids from uh, being pumped full of hormones, from being castrated at the first sign of uh, confusion. There is, as far as I know, still a trans day of vengeance scheduled for Saturday in Nashville. If you're praying tight, please pray. This is like uh, just really, I, I, you guys can tell me if I'm, you're being overly sort of glum and gloomy about this, but something about this one has felt incredibly ominous. And, and just, uh, you know, we've been talking on this podcast about demonic energy, evil energy. Um, to watch the kind of you know conflict between these you know heroic men, these these innocent children, uh, you know always of course that's the central tragedy in any of these events. It's you know terrible, horrific taking of innocent life, the splitting apart of families, but the added dimension here of you know uh, perhaps you know hormonal aggression, gender confusion, and the just constant drumbeat, which we've addressed before in other contexts, the constant drumbeat uh, from elite channels that. You know, Christians are a source of evil and hate, that white America is against black America, that straight America is against LGBTQIA plus America. You know, this stuff is now becoming increasingly explicit. You read some of the stuff from, say, the Trans Resistance Network, or, you know, I'm not going to send you to all of these different links, but just stuff that says, you know, effectively, this is what we do to, um, to these, you know, Christian, these hateful Christian people, pound them into the the dust and, and I mean really just the ravings of, of a truly kind of evil and I would say supernatural evil sort of energy spirit force whatever you want to call it and with that I'm that, that I think I've said everything that I want to say by way of introduction to this topic I, I want to open the floor and I know that it's like one thing our listeners sometimes say to us is that they listen because they hear uh, they log on and you know hear people talking through things that are difficult to process in a sane reality based context increasingly rare especially difficult in this kind of situation so guys uh yeah whatever you have to say uh, i would love to hear i mean what i was thinking about this 
is, you know, I don't know how much to make. I mean, look, obviously this person seems to have had some tremendous resentment against their school and maybe whatever they were taught there. And, you know, the thing is, like, whenever there's a school shooting, obviously the people who do it are, you know, have something wrong with them. They're mentally ill. I think a lot of trans people are mentally ill. I just don't know how much to make of, like, you know, I would hate to say like, oh, well, this is the the fault of, I mean, it's it of trans of the trans movement or something like that, which I don't think people are really saying. It seems like, like trans is the kind of mental illness that we're promoting now, and you know, you get a lot of like credit for being trans. So if you're a crazy mentally ill person, all of your obsessions and fixations are being hyped up. And, you know, I guess that could then lead you to go and, um, you know, I was talking to somebody was saying, like, why are there so many school shootings? And I, I mean, do people just hate school? Like, is that, I mean, is that part of the problem? There's a, there's, there is a distinction I think we can make, and I've been open to discussing both of these. That the distinction between saying, you know, this person, this obviously deeply disturbed person did this because of what the narrative is about, you know, transgenderism and how you need to like fight back against all this, you know, supposed fascism and hatred um, versus saying the response to this it demonstrated a real vindictiveness on the part of those that were ready to gloat over the victims. I would say that the latter is more. My reaction, because Seth, I agree with you, my inclination is always to take the foot off the gas when it comes to saying, like, look, this the person that did the shooting is the person that did the shooting. But there is also this kind of second part to it about yeah. what happened after, that this was like they had a comment, essentially. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I mean, I the, that, that, the, the uh, Governor Hobbs of Arizona, I don't know if you saw, like, her press secretary mm. tweeted this crazy picture of, like, Gina Rollins holding guns saying like thus always to transphobes or some crazy, crazy like validation of this violence. Oh, I, I mean, like when uh, people posing in front of the trans flag with guns, people, I mean, the stuff around this day of vengeance is just openly, I mean, like it would be totally fruitless to sit here and talk about like, oh, well, they don't kick these people off of Twitter, even though like Michael Knowles gets canceled for saying vengeance belongs to the Lord, but like, it is quite open and you can find it example after example of just really explicit calls for violence uh, for further violence. Right. Wow. Well, I'm just going to jump in here because it's, you know, too late not to, I guess. We all doubtless agree that there are too many school shootings, far too many. And too many events where somebody takes it upon themselves to just start killing their fellow citizens, and in many cases, their neighbors. That number should be zero. At the same time, I think it's important that we reflect seriously on just how few such shootings there really are in a nation pushing 350 million people where the degree of psychological and cultural and spiritual strain is as severe and the degree of drug use, legal and illegal prescription and otherwise is so ingrained. We are fortunate that there are not running battles in the streets every day. And if we're going to think clearly about what sort of phenomena are going to increase those pressures to a point where we go from whatever it is, 19 or 20 quote unquote mass shootings a year to hundreds or thousands, what will contribute to those pressures? Well, a belief that reality does not exist and we live in a simulation, a belief that everything about the human person is totally mutable and that the body is not a sacred gift 
a belief that someone's thoughts about you can pose an existential threat to your life and a belief that the only thing that can restore human agency in a world conquered by calculating machines is the unfettered exercise of the imagination. All of these forces are at work right now in pushing and pulling individuals, especially younger ones, in the direction of seeing quote unquote trans identities as sacred, as inviolable, as earning a sort of ticket to retributive justice, as, you know, a vanguard force leading us away from the irredeemable injustice of the past toward a, a gloriously post-human future. You know, you saw all of these things latently in the Matrix movies, and I'm not the only person to bring this up. But there's just no question that, you know, when you see uh, a person caught in the grip of this matrix of spiritual attitudes, murder multiple Christian children, you really start to reckon with what kinds of forces are going to lead toward a true epidemic of slaughter in America. And topping it all off, if you live in a country where, well, yes, you don't want to break any laws, but if you're the right kind of person, well, you can break laws, you can commit crimes, you can kill people, and nothing will happen to you. That's only going to make it worse. So we are playing with fire here. And if we are required by, uh, by law and by uh, the pressure of our government to pretend as if these forces are not at work and to pretend as if these forces will not further just uh, eviscerate uh, public order and the, 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 basic, the baseline of peace that needs to exist in the human heart in order to prevent a, a total downward spiral, we are not going to make it. It's difficult to talk about uh, and it's difficult to take action about in this climate. But this is a canary in the coal mine, and we need to take it seriously. That's a well-taken point, James. And just to offer a bit of empirics behind it, and I'm not the first to bring this up by borrowing from others, but notably a friend and Twitter and on Indian Bronson points out that, you know, America's always been gun crazy. That is not the changed variable over the over recent decades. It's precisely the forces and the breakdown of civic peace and the rise of sort of mental and spiritual decay and madness of various sorts that is at issue here. And so we should, um, we would do well to remember that and try to think through what are the causes of that. I suspect they're not, you know, the NRA spending more money on lobbying. It's something much, much deeper. So I, uh, I want to add to what you've just said. James, about all of the all of the different things that are happening that just pour into this conflagration. One of those things is the active dehumanization of Christians, the popular disdain for Christianity, and the the, the Christian Christians, whites, men, straights, you know, anybody who doesn't fit into this woke to victimhood hierarchy, the absolute scapegoating of those people and yeah, as I've said, dehumanization that, that that scapegoating really means. And another another group of people that is really, I think, actively dehumanized by the left and by woke people, and as I'll say in a moment and explain further, specifically the transgender movement is children. Um, yeah, so like this this active dehumanization of children, I think actually has something to do with this. And I understand the prudent desire to sort of take the foot off the gas in the wake of something like this. And in general, I do tend to take a more empathetic view of things, um, especially when it comes to transgenderism, because it's such a, uh, like a, a mind virus and, you know, there, but by the grace of God go I, I was the only girl on my baseball team when I was seven years old. I'm sure if I was born 15 years later, <laughs> my pediatrician would have questioned that. 
but anyway, as a mom, this event was activating. So I'm just going to say, I think transgenderism as a philosophy, as a social contagion, and as a political movement is thoroughly demonic, as you've said, Spencer, thoroughly demonic. There is absolutely nothing about it, about the movement that, that, that uh, warrants our empathy and understanding and, and nodding along. Like there's nothing, there's nothing redeem about, about the movement. The people, you know, I, we can separate the people from the movement, but the movement itself is so dark and evil and it has a hand to play in what just happened. On its foundation, it is spitting in the face of God and of creation. And when you do that, and the, the pride I think that it takes to do that and, and believe that deep down leads people to do absolutely like being annihilating things. That's just, this is just the logical end point of that core belief. And ch- what do children represent? What are children? Children are innocence, life, beauty, you know. They, 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 they represent the potential for the future and, and really the essential goodness of humanity. That is what they hate. And so children are a natural target for these people. And it's not just about, yes, transgenders, trans, transgenderism and these sick, disgusting, evil, hellbound doctors are transing kids. That's true. But <laughs> this is their, the, their attraction And use of children as a target, the transgender movement's use of children as a target is actually beyond that. It's beyond castrating them. It is a paraphilic and pedophilic movement in many ways at its foundation. Its founder, John Money, was a pedophile. Its flag is modeled after the standard uh, hospital-issued newborn swaddles. And, And I think that really clues us in to this unspeakable target of of that movement i they they are in 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 many real ways interested in children and they hate children and i think that what happened was a real expression of that hatred so anyway sorry i'll, I'll leave it at that no i mean it's as as i said alan you know it it it, it certainly shouldn't be something that we can't talk about right i mean because Again, I, I have said repeatedly on this podcast, and so I'm I'm like cautious about a certain degree of you know hypocrisy. I have said again and again that the person that does the shooting is responsible for the shooting. But uh, as you and James have both indicated, and as I think you know, we have I have argued in other contexts, like for instance, you know, uh, sort of BLM rhetoric motivated crimes. It's it's one thing to say you know the only person that pulls the trigger is the person that pulls the trigger. It's another thing to say, well, what do you think? is going to happen when mm. at every level of elite society at the at high, from the highest echelons daily day in and day out to the tune of millions probably billions of dollars it, with accolades and honors at every moment a, a story is told about what america is what sex is what the human person is which casts as you say Right, quite rightly, Helen, one group as the victim. And uh, over and over again, there's only one group about which you cannot say anything bad enough. And that is basically these pe- these kinds of people that were killed. You know, white Christians. Um, I don't actually know for sure that all of the victims were were white, but this uh, you know, the when you have a nation of that many people, when there are going to be some people who are unhinged, who are who suffer from, you know, all sorts of disorders and difficulties, um, they are going to latch on to whatever narrative is most, is closest to hand that will feed and confirm and reinforce their delusions and their resentments and all of the terrible things that Satan whispers in your ear when you're in his grip. And at the moment, if you were once this person and you were casting about for a totalizing description, who is to blame? For all that is wrong, who, who carries the sin of the world and must therefore be wiped out? It would certainly be very easy to accept from on high, from the uh, supposed authorities of the culture, this story that, yeah, it, what's you know essentially 
you know, true about you is mm -hmm. that you can reshape yourself however you want and that any kind of limits, including and perhaps especially the, the sacred you know, fence that we place around childhood and, and innocence and, and life and all the things that we cherish most in this you know, sin ridden world, when everybody at the highest levels of society is telling you that those things are oppressive and evil and wrong, and what you really need to be doing is, you know, letting elementary school teachers talk to children about how they can change their sex and their, their private parts, well, then, yeah, you do get to sort of say, well, what's going to, you know, happen to a person that's already flailing in that situation, reaching out for some kind of totalizing description of the world, you know? I mean, truly, the, the shame that we must constantly be heaping, I think, all the time, we ought to be heaping shame upon those people in positions of power and authority who have been elevated to the highest levels of our society and who have betrayed that trust, not only, you know, just kind of casually and unthinkingly, but determinedly as a matter of principle, again and again, insistently, over and over again. And you're absolutely right, James, why wouldn't this have happened more often? It's, it's a, an amazing testament to the psychic resilience of the American people, that this is not, you know, already devolving into something uglier and, and, and darker. And, you know, if, if we if we can't speak bluntly and openly about that, then I, I suspect it will. I will say as well, great points, by the way, but um, additionally, in a much less philosophical, but more acute way, I think that this was triggered by the, uh, the, the fact that Tennessee has recently made it illegal to yes. um, chemically castrate children. And the trans political movement went about calling that trans genocide. Right. Yeah, it's pretty amazing the way they, they keep casting this. And they also keep saying that all these states have, have um, banned drag performances, that they've made drag illegal. I mean, to, to my mind, I mean, that hasn't happened at all. I mean, I think if anything that's happened, it's just like, well, you, you can't do drag performances in schools or children shouldn't go to them. I see a lot of things like, oh, you think drag is so outrageous. Well, guess what? In the Navy, they used to do drag shows on, uh, you know, um, on ships or look at uh, some like it hot or, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah, of course. Yes. Grownups have always played dress up. And there's always been this type of thing. You know, sure, in Shakespearean England, the female roles were played by boys. Yes, it's nothing new. Um, we get that. This refusal to acknowledge that there's a difference between, you know, what adults do with adults or what adult, you know, or part like what you, I guess you might call like, you know, even a, having a man wearing a dress and like Milton Berle or something on television, it's still different from having like drag performers doing, you know, simulated sex acts or, you know, half nude or whatever in front of little kids, which is completely gratuitous. Yeah. Milton Berle um, was never like, in a thong. Well, I mean, yeah, the, all of these things are are true. I mean, I, I will say I, I think that the law which was passed in Tennessee about about drag uses the language of adult cabaret performances. Somebody can check me on that. You know, th there have been a number of possible sort of solutions, legal solutions floated to the problem that you alluded to at the end there, James. People have been trying, since it's an extremely new issue, nobody ever thought until five minutes ago that it would be not only acceptable, but actually a, you know, a, a moral right, a human right to subject children to all sorts of grotesquery. Yeah, people have been sort of casting about for legal language to capture and reflect just what is objectionable in that. And so there have been like a number of different laws, bills across the country for, for dealing with that. But the other thing about this that like is whether you think this is a perfectly principled, you know, execution of our highest ideals or whatever is simply a political reality that once you start coming for people's kids, it's actually not their job to parse the minutia of distinction between the varieties of drag. Like that is the last thing that is on the mind of sober, sensible people when you go to like a park and there's a guy with enormous fake plastic breasts that he's waving in, in the full view of minors, or indeed there's footage coming out of minors being you know, taken purposefully or subjected purposefully to these sorts of 
displays, it's like, you know, that, that somehow it amounts to genocide for people to have a, a strong reaction against that, which is enacted through legislatures by duly elected uh, you know, the members and representatives of the people. Yeah, that kind of rhetoric is incendiary. To call that genocide, to convince young people, impressionable people, that they are at risk of extermination, of being, you know, actually wiped out by the state simply because the representatives of the people are trying to deal with a predatory phenomenon. Yeah, that is a that's a, an extremely irresponsible thing to tell people, and it's going to get into the heads of young, uh, vulnerable individuals. To continue with your Milton Berle thing, Seth, uh, you know, and this is obvious to everyone, but yeah, if, if Milton Berle had shown up in a thong as a man and gyrating, uh, you know, not only would the show have been canceled, but the TV network probably would have been shut down at least uh, till people figured out what the hell was going on. So it's it's just silly. The well, yeah, I mean, are just get... silly, and they're purposefully silly. I mean, it it's not like the left doesn't know what they're up to on this, uh, and then there's a lot of sort of um, useful idiots who just kind of parrot this stuff, not really thinking through the distinction that's obvious and commonsensical to everyone, which is it's very different to throw a, a drag show brunch with scantily clad uh, men dressed as women, visible genitalia often under, uh, you know, a little bit of clothing and having children, yeah, often under the age of eight or, or 10 at least, you know, putting dollars uh, in people's uh, g-strings, or maybe you know, well, I don't want to mischaracterize it around the waistband of such performances. I mean, it's right. it's insane that we even have to argue about these things. In a, and that that's country. the point. Yeah, that that's the point, really, to like expose children to this, and that's supposed to be like salubrious. Like this is what we need to do. That's the, yeah, weird... the distinction. The distinction that you guys are making is obvious to any thinking. Person. You don't have to have a PhD in gender studies. In fact, it's probably an advantage not to have a PhD in gender studies to be able to tell the difference between like a kind of time immemorial adults transgressive act that actually reinforces in many ways gender roles right. and whatever the heck this is. Um, and the only reason that anybody is even having to go through the laborious and blunt legal procedure of making mm -hmm. that distinction is because the left systematically undertook to blur the line. When they did that, when they said that, oh, yeah, it's the same. Monty Python is the same thing as twerking in a public library. It's like, well, no, it's obviously not. And nobody would have had to get the law involved in the reasons why it's not if you hadn't conflated the two things. And so now we're in this situation. Sorry, this stuff is going to get outlawed. Like, I, I have zero, zero patience for any of that. Does anybody want to, want to say anything else about this? I, I think I, I'd like to move us on from this topic. But, uh, but. I, I don't want to cut anybody off prematurely. It sounds like Helen, you might have something to say. I just, they really, they set themselves up for success in this way, don't they? I mean, they, they caused the problem. It's like they caused the problem and then force the rest of America to find a solution that is some, at some point between the problem and what used, used to be normal. So that's, this is really the essence of our, our, progressive, no pun intended, move leftward is just them causing problems all the time and then forcing forcing compromise and then, you know, acting like it, acting like any sort of resistance amounts to, as we've said, genocide. So it's it's so evil. <laughs> They're such liars, you know? They really just they just lie and steal and deceive. And this is just the essence of the American political left. Okay, let's move on. Uh, James has to duck. Out. <laughs> James does have to duck out, so we should uh, move on oh, to yeah, one yeah, topic very relevant to him. But I will just say quickly, Spencer, before we go out, mm. uh, three cheers for uh, for the real men, that is not the trans men, who uh, went in there and in the span of under four minutes uh, took out the threat once they rolled up Rex Engelbert and Michael Colazzo. Although they they weren't the only ones, they were just the ones who ended up taking shots. There were at least three other. Uh, law enforcement men um, running towards the gunfire. And that should be uh, something we should take heart and buy and uh, be proud of and, and bestow honor on those men for doing that. You're here. Give them every medal there is. Say their names again and again. And if you have the stomach for it, watch that uh, footage because uh, it's, worth, it's worth considering what it takes to act in times of 
of crisis. And yeah, exactly, Ryan. Uh, the, the distinction between the real manhood of uh, control, protective violence, and the satanic perversion of manhood uh, on display in wanton slaughter is um, is one that bears our contemplation, and certainly on for Engelbert and Palazzo, our uh, celebration or gratitude. Okay. Um, yes, James has drawn the short straw, as indeed he often does when it falls to him to explain, mostly to me, but really to also our listeners, what is going on in tech world. At the moment, we should talk, we want to talk about this open letter on pausing, it's called Pause Giant AI Experiments. We've already on this podcast discussed the sort of rapid uptick in AI capabilities. We've discussed whether I is really the right letter, whether this really is a form of intelligence, if most of us lean in the negative direction. But, uh, you know, massive language learning software, uh, ChatGPT, then the visual stuff, Dolly, MidJourney, these programs that if you're online, you've heard of and maybe played around with and seen that are capable of turning up into some sort of giant electronic maw, all sorts of different content from the internet, and then responding to verbal and in some cases visual prompts to recombine and recreate, you know, what you ever you ask it to with some with sometimes comical results, but oftentimes somewhat chilling results or indeed impressive results, depending on your perspective, things that, uh, you know, certainly blow out of the water anything that we've seen before on like the chat bot that answers your question at the online banking service or whatever. Um, but I will mention, by the way, that I was on Skype the other day and uh, there was a little Bing AI that popped up to offer to answer my questions. I didn't have time to play with it, but this stuff is obviously kind of moving through the bloodstream. And like so many of these changes, it seems to have caught a lot of people off guard and to be raising kind of alarm bells about how quickly it's moving and whether we're ready for it. So that's what this open letter is about. I'm going to read like a paragraph from it, and then I'm just going to ask James to sort of talk about uh, some helpful ways that we might be able to think about this reaction and the uh, reaction to advanced AI in general. Uh, it begins, AI systems with human competitive intelligence can pose profound risks to society and humanity, as shown by extensive research and acknowledged by top AI labs, as stated in the widely endorsed Asilomoral Asilomor AI principle, excuse me, Advanced AI could represent a profound change in the history of life on Earth and should be planned for and managed with commensurate care and resources. Skipping down powerful AI systems could be developed only once we are confident their effects will be positive and their risks will be manageable. This confidence must be well justified and increase with the magnitude of the system's potential effects. Therefore, we call on all AI labs to immediately pause for at least six months training of AI systems more powerful than GPT-4, which, as I understand it, is the latest uh, GPT chat system. Uh, it did make a leap, I think, over uh, three, version three. And among the signatories, I mean, names which don't, some names which don't give me an enormous amount of confidence that this comes from a place that we're going to like. Um, but you all know Harari is one. Um, Elon Musk is another, of obviously, mixed kind of pedigree on this and other topics. There are a few others that you'd meant that you'd note. Uh, Andrew Yang is one. Steve Wozniak, co-founder of Apple. So big names here, James. Uh, what should know and think about when stuff? The most important thing for uh, Americans to understand here is that there are multiple factions uh, in and out of government um, scrambling to protect their interests and advance their agenda. And so pretty much every us versus them dynamic that is being presented to us conceals uh, something more important that's going on below the surface. So, you know, as you suggested, uh, the list is is kind of sus. I noticed they had Ja Rule on there answering Dave Chappelle's infamous and longstanding question, where is Ja? And there are some other questionable names on there, too. You know, you got Yuval Harari on there who thinks that Buddhism is science and that uh, the only way that uh, humanity can uh, carry on is by uh, merging with our machines into some kind of pseudo divine entity. Why would someone like that be be asking for a pause? 
Uh, Elon Musk has been fighting unsuccessfully with Sam Altman for control of OpenAI, which he was responsible in large part for launching. So it's it's a it's a um, you know it's mud wrestling, and uh, there is no center here. Not even our own uh, deep state. You know the the folks who you can't vote in and can't vote out, and usually you don't even know by name. You know, they've got their own interests. I mean, what we've seen with uh, just the the brouhaha over TikTok is another indicator. You know, you can be against TikTok for all the, the right reasons and still end up supporting a piece of legislation, which if you look under the hood, basically, you know, Congress just delegating the, the final remnants of its uh, power over to the uh, the executive branch's uh, alphabet agencies to make unilateral and arbitrary decisions about who to step on on the internet. When things like this, if and when things like this pass and, and you know, God willing, they won't, it is just going to singe the eyelashes off of Americans how quickly we move from a recognizable, you know, system of government, which we have done our best to to keep going since the founding, and replace it with something that is utterly alien to to anything that most Americans would recognize as their country. And so as important as it is to recognize that, yes, um, an unfettered uh, attempt uh, by people who are aspiring to achieve cyborg divinity to build uh, machines that can know everything about us without having an understanding of, of what a human being actually is. Yeah, there are risks. And yes, perhaps we should take a breather before we end up in a position where our humanity is thrown away. Nevertheless, if we, you know, banning TikTok isn't going to solve this problem. Pausing AI development isn't going to solve this problem. We need affirmative steps to put the control of fundamental technologies back into the hands of the American people where they need to be in order for us to maintain our constitutional system and maintain the protection of our foundational rights uh, going into a digital age. It's not going to be policies. It's not going to be nibbling around the edges. It's not going to be punishing, you know, picking winners and losers here or there. It is going to be about explicitly codifying in our foundational law the rights implicit in the First and Second Amendment as they apply to our our life in a digital world. Uh, we, you know, keeping and bearing arms. That doesn't just mean mechanical uh, shooting machines. You know, it, it, in a digital age, it means things like high power GPUs. It means things like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. It means the ability not just to have free speech on the Internet, but to freely associate on the Internet. And it means freedom from around the clock surveillance by a secret government and a lot of other things besides. These things flow implicitly out of the Bill of Rights. And if the feds in Congress are going to be derelict in their duty to protect and enforce these things, then the states are going to have to do it themselves. And I'm sorry to say that time is a wasting and uh, the runway is short. So governors, state lawmakers, now is the time. You know, call us. We can help you. If action is not taken... These trends are going to continue no matter who gets paused or who gets banned or who gets broken up. And we're going to find ourselves in an unrecognizable environment that is going to melt minds and, and break people at a, a soul deep level. We owe Americans a lot better than that. And we still have the tools at our disposal right now to take the action we need to stop a real apocalypse. Thanks for that, James. And I, I everyone, feel more informed. I'm glad to hear you confirm my sense that these are not the people that know what they're doing because this just seems like another domain in which the sort of rubber stamp credentialed uh cooked up in a lab authorities increasingly feel like one can hear the rising note of desperation behind their press releases and so whereas I do sort of agree that it would be nice to think about these things before they rush to their, you know, singularity level conclusions, I also find myself feeling like, A, that's not probably going to happen. Like, that's not really how this sort of thing tends to 
work, you're not going to tell people like just stop doing technology while we figure some things out. And especially you're not going to do that when the thing in the box marked figure some things out is kind of like big hand gesturing and words about like, you know, fulfillment and other such sort of empty gestures. I also suspect that what will come out of that box will look a lot less like human flourishing and a lot more like DEI, like a lot more like, well, we need to make sure these things are equitable and we have to encourage them. To the, I mean, this this technology already has a lot of those rule assumptions built into it, at least in many of its iterations. And yeah, I just, there's something about this that even just the tone and vocabulary of this letter that I just don't trust. And by contrast, you know, James has a solution. I mean, you're talking about like an actual thing that we could do to extend and reify our constitutional principles in the digital domain. It just seems like that's a more promising route forward than to say like, well, we just need to slow things down and let the experts kind of sit in a room for six months to slow the spread and at that point, we'll really have our, we'll wrap our brains around it and we'll have the models and the charts to predict what's going to happen and we can manage from our sort of seat of power. I mean, I, I know that's not what they're explicitly saying here, but at this point, I feel like I sort of smell that attitude in this letter. Yeah, I'll speak for James because he had to run. Well, I'll just speak. I don't need to speak for James. But I, <laughs> this problem is, uh, I don't know if anyone watched the Taibbi Schellenberger testimony before Congress, but I forget who, but one of the, not the brightest bulbs in the batch, one of the Democrats, I don't mean to suggest that Democrat, geront gerontocratic Democrats are disproportionately dim compared to Republicans, uh, table that partisan point. But uh, she, she said either to Taibbi or Schellenberger, I forget um, in questioning, I think it was Taibbi, and she said, you wrote on your... Um, on, on something called on your website uh, or your blog, your sub stack. I, I'm not quite sure what that is. I mean, the idea that a critical mass of legislators who really have no idea what this technology even does because they still aren't quite sure what the e-newsletter, for lack of a better term, that is quickly displacing modern journalism and providing six-figure livelihoods for independent journalists over the last couple of years, they don't even know what it is. Uh, they still call it a blog. I mean, whatever the terms are kind of, I guess, capture it well enough, but still the idea that these people will understand what's underfoot or what, what's happening with, with AI or large language model machine learning stuff that's releasing new versions of itself. Well, it's not itself, but programmers are releasing, releasing new versions of it, you know, every month now or whatever it is. Uh, the idea that they could be competent to deal with this problem or figure out what it means for self-government in a uh, republic in which de democratic deliberation or public deliberation is important, uh, you see the magnitude of the problem. Uh, let alone the other problem, which is that, and that's a, that's a running theme of this podcast and a lot of our work at Claremont, that these legislators have not really been in the serious business of lawmaking or uh, appropriating or any of the older ways of doing normal legislative government for decades. So it, this is a huge, huge problem, and one that I think state legislators and federal legislators are just completely out of their depth on. So you- But you know, Ryan, you know. Ryan, doesn't this kind of like, isn't that the same argument that the technocrats would make? Like these legislators yeah. are incapable. So that's why we need to have like, Andrew Yang and yeah. Peter Thiel or it's, whoever running the show. It's why we're in a real pickle. Yeah. Okay. So, so that, you know, the um, <laughs> con Congress creators have to do the impossible, right? They have to assert their newly realized or reclaim sovereignty over the expert class, whether it be private or public, while at the same time getting up to speed on this very complex subject and legislating on it. And the state of big tech, corporate big tech, is such that the old libertarian solution of just, you know, stepping back legislatively w will not suffice, as well as uh, you're confronted, confronted by this other problem that I outlined, which is that you need to, you need, these legislators need to go to school or find people that they can rely on in their staff or otherwise 
that can help them get up to speed on this problem and what it means for these fundamental issues that James talks about. Uh, you know, I think a lot of our listeners aren't quite sure what James means about updating the First and Second Amendments for our digital age, but, you know, James has talked about and he's um, channeling his friend Ardian Tola, who uh, is um, an innovator and entrepreneur in, in tech, but one of the good guys, has called a Second Amendment for compute, which is to say, um, you know, the right to keep and bear arms has an analog of the digital age, and it probably means something like protecting from government, banning under the pretenses of some national security threat, banning things like things that would ensure some semblance of independence and um, individual sovereignty within the larger net, um, context of American republicanism. Things like crypto, not just Bitcoin, but um, crypto more broadly speaking, blockchain technology more broadly speaking, ways of ensuring privacy and independence and self-reliance in an increasing, increasingly digital age where making one's living <clears throat> is intimately connected to these sorts of tools, including you know, GPUs and all the rest. We don't need to get into the technical sides of this, but there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, I hope that Claremont can play its role in connecting the founding principles to the legislative necessities of our digital age. Uh, it's something we're working on and uh, everyone needs to work more quickly on it. Having said that, I think I'm going to kind of call an audible and pass over, unless anybody has any burning comments to make about the TikTok hearings. It's sort of folded into everything that we just said, that there just seems like legislators were increasingly out of their depths, that they were confronted with the very real, I wouldn't call it a possibility, that there's a quite apparent situation of more and more people being spied on and tracked by China via TikTok. It doesn't seem like there are legislators anything to do about it. And it also seems like China itself has kind of its own restrictions, domestic restrictions relating to the stuff that they're very happy to pump into our eyeballs. So underscoring simply, I suppose, the necessity of getting much more serious about this at a sort of high level, you know, political theory principles, high order political theory principles level, and also legislative action. And with that, I am going to lead us on into everybody's favorite segment, Read the Damn Site. Uh, this is where we highlight things that we uh, have enjoyed over the past week, pieces that particularly struck us. I think that I'm going to deftly refrain from stealing Ryan's pick. And I'm just going to talk about what I think you're going to pick, Ryan, when you talk about it as a gesture of deference toward our fearless leader. <laughs> um, and Instead of citing probably my number one piece from the week, I'm going to cite, it's always a good day when Mary Harrington writes for our site, and in this case, a particularly exciting occasion because she's published a piece called Let Men Be, and it's an excerpt from her new book, Feminism Against Progress. I have it in my hands. I have read it. It's phenomenal, as everything Mary Rice is, but it really brings together a lot of strands from research, uh, not only to do with what she typically writes uh, about with us, and that's the kind of transgnostic phenomenon, um, and kind of the you know, 12th, third to gajillionth wave feminisms, but also now in this piece about the this need for recovering uh, a healthy sense of sex segregation and spaces and time and times and places where uh, men can sort of gather together and discuss and learn and practice how to be men. Women can gather together, discuss, learn, and practice how to be women. Um, I make it sound way more academic than, than she does. She's just talking about restoring a sense of sanity to our, you know, single sex gender relations as well as our, um, you know, it, uh, as well as our heterosexual uh, actual gender relations, sex relations. Like that. That's all very long way saying. Go read Mary Harrington's piece, Let Men Be. It's from her new book, which you should also check out uh, on Amazon or wherever you get your books called Feminism Against Progress. Now. Turn it over to the gang. Well, I'll just say something quickly to um, slide in a, one last um, comment about TikTok. I, I say that a good way for people to think about it is, and this only just came to me. And it's you know it's not that sophisticated or clever, but uh, you know the the problem of TikTok is dual, and it has an analog in what China's been doing with uh, pouring fentanyl into the United States uh, and poisoning and killing our populace, uh, especially the more vulnerable and mentally ill and homeless, etc. And, and kids, for that matter. Uh, TikTok is not only a vehicle for Chinese spying on Americans uh, through 
this app that uh, emanates from China and it's from a Chinese company or Chinese holding company. I forget the exact details. But it's also psychological fentanyl for our children. And TikTok, TikTok has played a huge role uh, in the, I think, and I think this is becoming more empirically true, in the um, psychological corruption, especially of young women uh, in this whole, whole sort of trans trans and identity politics, mimetic viral spread of mental illness. And uh, so double reasons to ban it. I will just say that my piece in Spencer Yui did anticipate what I was going to pick. Okay. Is Soviet America's Sweethearts. That's the name of the piece by Scott McConnell, who is a founding editor of the American Conservative. And it's about the Red Scare podcast and the unlikely, uh, the interesting cultural political phenomenon of, uh, of these two I think they're both Belarusian or Russian uh, emigres who came very young, um, Dasha and Anna. Um, I won't try to pronounce the, their um, Russian or Belarusian last names uh, because I don't want to butcher them. But they, they run the Red Scare podcast. They have for years now. And Scott sort of, in a, in a fun and lively way, there's at least one vulgar line in there, so don't send it to your children, people, talks about their evolution, that is the two podcasters' evolution from kind of socialist identifying Bernie chicks, Bernie bro chicks, to through the summer of Floyd and then the kind of insanities of the left of the last few years have become kind of semi-right wing in their fun and irreverent and kind of bohemian Manhattan art scene way of puncturing the pieties of the left on trans, you know, on gender stuff and on their, the left's hypocrisy on various issues and, and, and all the rest. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's, you know, they're, I guess they're in the wider genre of the, what would have been called two years ago, but it's now an anachronistic term in a way, the dirtbag left, which is to say the left being critical of itself, although they've evolved into something more like a quasi right wing podcast. And it's uh, it's an interesting cultural and political phenomenon. And, um, Scott likes to make the point that just as in the, say, the 1920s through the 1960s, you had a species of former communist leftist moving to the right as a result of the hypocrisy, mendacity, and brutality of the Soviet system coming to light. The analog today is you have a new species of leftist who's moved right as the modern neo-Marxist left or cultural Marxist left has gone more and more insane and that's a fun funny irreverent podcast that is and it, it's also he points out as well it, it shows the new way of the, the new way to make a living for cultural and journalistic commentators of various stripes you know this makes both these women i think uh, six figure incomes at this point because they have a they have a free segment and then if you want all of it including you know special stuff you can pay monthly for it and they have quite a following and um, one of them is an act actress, um, Dasha. Well, that probably helps with the following a bit, as celebrity always does. But it's a great, fun piece. And uh, if you're not up on this phenomenon on the left and on the kind of Gen Z left, it's an interesting read. I will. Uh, I mean, yes, yeah, uh, Oh, no, I just wanted to say for my piece, I was going to suggest um, our friend Raw Egg Nationalist has a really... Uh, a really interesting item called Friends and Enemies, and it's about this social media guy, Ricky Vaughn, Douglas Mackey, who is, uh, you know, being hounded by the DOJ because in 2016, he put up a joke tweet saying, um, don't forget, you can vote on, don't forget, Black women for Hillary, you can vote online, just tweet your vote. And now he's being prosecuted for, you know, obscure laws from the 1870s regarding, um, you know, disenfranchising people from the vote. I mean, it's really like this crazy abuse of federal power, as we see over and over again. But um, uh, very interesting piece by Raw Egg Nationalist, Friends and Enemies. Yeah, just a few pieces of meat on that bone for those who are interested in the legal side of it. It's the Ku, Ku Klux Klan Act. And Part of the provisions in that is, you know, you can't commit a conspiracy across state lines to deprive people of their civil rights. So the argument is that uh, Doug Mackey, by joking this way, deprived people across state lines because it was a digital medium across the state lines uh, to deprive them of their 15th Amendment right to vote. So that's the, that's the sort of legal hook 
uh, it's absurd. And and if anyone who's been following it at the same, literally the same day, people on the left were joking about, uh, you know, sending, joking in a way to kind of send right wing right wingers as they the the people on the left perceive them through their tweets to go vote, you know, improperly vote or waste their vote. So he's just being singled out. It's just yet another example of legal action by the feds masquerading or I'm sorry, uh, persecution by the feds of you for political viewpoints masquerading as, you know, a neutral upholding of the law and civil rights, et cetera. So yeah, it's a great piece. That was my, that was my favorite too. Yeah. And I think uh, the specific story in the story that he uses is a hook to talk about his main point, which is a Schmidtian point that uh, we should stop looking at the left and sort of acting offended and flabbergasted that they don't live up to the principles that they sort of use to browbeat us into submission. That's a really important point. And uh, it's actually, I mean, it kind of dovetails with the, the tragedy that we just talked about. I think there are a lot of conservative people now who are kind of looking around at at you know woke capital and wondering, oh my goodness, why isn't Coca Cola making a statement, you know, talking about how this is a hate crime against Christians? And it's like, well, you know what? I think we just need to really sit with the discomfort and the truth that these are our enemies and behave accordingly. <laughs> I mean, I, I just it, it it's limiting for for conservatives to ex- to expect these people to play by the rules and as as um as rog nationalists as he goes on to say the point is to be more unapologetic in our own pursuit of of power now this is this is sounding kind of intense but um <laughs> but i'm not going to back down <laughs> That uh, I think that's all of us. Okay, um, I am gonna as I sort of already co-signed Brian's uh, Red Scare endorsement. I would also just like to endorse the Red Scare podcast for our listeners. Our listeners are probably the single demographic in America that least needs an endorsement of the Red Scare podcast. And there's like an enormous Venn diagram overlap. But if you listen to only one podcast in the world, it should be the Roundtable. If you listen to you know, only two or three, it should be the remaining affiliated podcasts of the various hosts. We all have our own projects round and about. But after you get done listening to all, subscribing to all the Claremont podcasts, you should absolutely subscribe to Red Scare. I've tried to get my family into it with limited success, but I just <laughs> feel a serious sense of evangelism about Red Scare. And with that, we will bring this episode to a close. Thank you all for listening to the round table. It is out for privilege and honor to share the airwaves with you and to talk through the good, the bad, and the ugly of life this crazy time. If you like this show, we would really appreciate uh, if you would support us. Share, spread the word, give us five stars. It really, really helps. Let, let your friends know. Tweet if you have Twitter. Do whatever you can to get the word out. Uh, that really helps. And you can learn more about all the stuff that we do. This is only the beginning of the Claremont Institute's uh, various offerings. You can go to ClaremontReviewOfBooks.com to read CRB. You can go to AmericanMinds.org to read our site. Uh, you can go to DC.Claremont.org to check out our DC-based Center for the American Way of Life and all the political action that we are taking uh, through that outlet and venue. And if you'd like to support the work that we do, we would be most grateful if you go to DC, uh, you can go to Claremont.org, excuse me, Claremont.org slash donate to support us. We're always happy to give shout out to our donors, but we also respect the wishes of those which do remain anonymous. And uh, with that, thank you very much to our production and to engineering crew, Jake Gannon and Logan Zeffieri. And thanks to you all for listening. Talk to you next week. Bye.